driving down. Didn't you see Since 98, that's what she was doing. Good morning, everybody. If you don't mind, just. Uh, oh, it's that time already? Oh, at 10 30. That's it. Let's start on time. Yeah. People slept in, Absolutely. Yeah. Groups are diminishing faithfully. So um, that's basically it. Good morning also for those who are watching on YouTube channel. So take your outlines with you because this morning um, will be some kind of a very explanatory and stuff like this. So thank you so much for coming this morning. Coffee is ready. I'm going to give you a break in a moment of time in about 45 minutes. A little pause. And we are on page number one of your outlines. Make sure that you are at the right place in the book of Colossians chapter one under Roman numeral second. I'm going to do a short review of what we did two weeks ago, the extent of Christ's supremacy. And then we will embark in capital B, the basis for Christ's supremacy, the basis for this. So it's going to be um, very informative this morning. And uh, yeah, we should take our time of prayer. Concentrate, take a deep breath while I pray, just to make sure that we um, receive what we need to receive this morning. Because basically what's on the screen, he speaks of it as having the highest possible importance for Christian doctrine. And this morning you will be exposed to a few things that you might not have heard before. So, um, yeah, God bless you as we move on. And, um, and thank you. Let's take a little bit of a silent time. Some people might join in a bit later type of thing. Uh, Karen Croft um, is not well, so that's why she's not here right now. So uh, Karen is not here. I don't know about anybody else that nobody sits there. Yeah, that's it. I, the, the, the Fred and Marilyn are away, I think. Yeah. So anyway, let's take a silent time. God of light, we need to see the truth through you, the truth through you and through the light of your presence within us. We are thankful for all the attributes that you do possess. There are many in which we relate. Long-suffering, patience, forgiveness, long-suffering, and so on. You know our frame, Father, we're very limited in capacity. We are very limited in strength. Thank you for your patience again. Help us to have a good disposition of the soul this morning to understand how big you are. To understand the purpose of your two comings and to be restored into fellowship with you to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're just starting right now. If it's okay, you just uh, make sure that you set up the proper page. I'm going to make a review, so you're going to have time to set up at the proper page. Two weeks ago, before my departure, uh, we did the extent of Christ's supremacy. And I ask you to understand this in light of the Colossian false teaching, heresies that were going around in the first century in the church in Asia concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that was not sufficient for everything that uh, we needed additions and so on. Words such as ascetism and depreciating the person of Jesus Christ to an extent, making him less than he was so that we need something else, some more revelation and so on and so forth. So that's why it's very good to understand these things specifically nowadays. They teach the same thing in some capacity. We looked at the, uh, good morning, we looked at the extent of Christ's supremacy with the concept of the Memra. And he spoke, and these things were created. What things? 
all of it here, basically. Everything that you see, everything that exists, basically came into existence by the power of his word. He spoke it, and it came into being. That's probably the concept of the memra that Paul had in mind. We have seen this also, which I like, that for those who saw Christ, they saw the exact representation of God's, like a die printing a coin. So that's the exact imprint, the amplified version. I have the word imprint, and that's what we have seen. We have seen also the concept of the firstborn, that I would like you to study by your own, the firstborn of all creation, because the firstborn basically does not emphasize creation, but it does emphasize uniqueness. Keep in mind always, dear beloved, that Christ was not created. He was always pre-existent, and in the course of time he became a man, but he was always existing in the form of God and so on. And Christ is the end, it's a review, and the goal towards whom all things were intended to move. And the constellation by itself, it's moving, planets surrounding the moon and so on, the solar system and outside of it is sustained by his word, by the memra. So basically you can write down if you want to by the Lord Jesus Christ because he has the fullness of God. And everything coheres. It, it coheres together, glued together, simply by being what he is, I am, Jehovah. I am, which is the verb to be. Everything holds together so far. Nothing is collapsing as far as the planet and the system, simply because he sustains it. If he would stop to sustain it, everything would be dissolved in a moment of time. And he is the head of the church in verse 18 of chapter 1. This is all review. He is the head of the church. So being the head, we draw from the head and we move on and so on. A thing that needs to be reminded to the church age. We're not board led, but we are led by the church here. He has the directing brain. That's why the body of the Messiah, the church, is a living organism. It lives and he sustains it, and he nourishes it. So that was basically, Carol and Ernie, and that the small review, and right now you are up to speed with me. We attack Roman numeral second, capital B, the basis for Christ is supremacy. So right now we'd like you to put your finger on your outline. B, under Roman numeral two, the basis for Christ is supremacy. We read, we circle a few things, and then we come back and sharpen your pencils because this morning it will be what I promised two weeks ago for to make it to be. So now we read verses 19 to 23. I ask you to circle a few things, come with me, and we do the exposition of it. Let me see if it's recording. It is recording. Good. Verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness, circle fullness, to dwell in him. Circle the word dwell. And through him, capital H, Jesus, to reconcile, circle reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth, circle earth, and circle things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienate, alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he was now, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I'm going to ignore verse 23 right now because I simply don't think that we will do it this morning for verse 23 and so on. <coughs> Last week, two weeks ago, we did capital A, the extent, and right now we look at the grounds on which Paul affirms such a great supremacy on the part of Christ. We look at the grounds of it. 
Verse 19, circle the word for, because it was, or for, it was the Father's good pleasure. Circle the word for, simply because the word or the connection for goes with what precedes the previous statement of two weeks ago, capital A, the extent of Christ's supremacy. Look at verse 20 also, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Right now, today, this morning, we need to look at three words in verses 19 and 20. The three words are on the screen in front of you, fullness, dwelling, and in verse 20, it's going to be reconcile or reconciliation. I have many things to explain, so right now I'm back to verse 19 here. But when you combine verses 19 and 20, we need to look at three words together and define them and see how it works in the context that they are given. In verse 19a, it says, It was the Father good's pleasure. Simply put, it was decreed by God. What was decreed by God is this, that the fullness of the Godhead would reside in Christ. God decided it, that the fullness of the Godhead, this is the first word that you look at, fullness, number one, that the fullness of the Godhead would dwell in him. Here I have this. I cut and paste a picture of the constellation and everything, the best I could find. And of course, science teaches that the universe is expanding at 100 miles an hour daily. Okay, Duke? Look at what I will be doing for a moment here. If I make it expand to the left a little bit here, uh, just a sec, I just want to do something here. Look at what I do. If I make it expand to the left here and I put this here, God remains kind of outside of it. The teaching is this right now, that God is not in the universe, but the universe is in God. As much as you can expand this here to the top, to the bottom, to the left, or to the right, God would move all the time, simply because God is bigger than the universe. I am not a scientist. I'm a theologian. So it doesn't matter to me if it does expand. It can expand as much as it wants. God is bigger than, the, than it. It can expand millions of years if you want, but God will always be bigger than the universe. Well, if the universe is expanding, it just means basically that God is still creating. Uh, no, they are already existing. Whatever it does expand is already there. It's not still creating. Everything has been created already. Really? Yeah. It does not keep doing this right now. It's, it's just for us if it does expand that you can see further, but I don't have the proof that this is expanding. I cannot prove to you that this is expanding, expanding because I'm not a scientist here. So God created already everything that he's willing to create? Absolutely. It's all done. Okay? Bear with me for a moment. I'll come back to an extent to these things. But the universe that we have there, it's for us to discover it. That's why we say that this is expand, but I'm not, th that this is expanding, but I'm not convinced that this is the truth. That's what I said. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a theologian. Creation has been already made. Okay? He created it by the power of his mouth and so on. Doesn't matter how big, as much as you can discover it, the point is that the universe is in God, and the universe is not big enough to contain Him. That's the point that I want you to know. Okay? The universe is not, it, 
It will never, God transcends the universe. It doesn't matter how big it, it will become, God is bigger than it. That's why on the four corners here, I put God, because I wanted the box of the universe to be there and in God. God is not in the universe, because God is not expanding. All right? And the idea together, it's to discover the fullness of Christ. The universe is in God, and Christ is God, so in Him dwells the fullness of God. I just gave you a key sentence right now. Christ is God. That's why in verse 19, 19 it says, because it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. The Him refers to Christ. Do you, are you with me? That's why I said concentrate. Yeah. Don't come up with too many questions right now. I will try to answer this at the end. But I am not a scientist. I don't care if the universe is expanding on God. Uh, the, expand, the, the universe is expanding daily. It's not our issue here. Our issue is to understand fully that the universe is in God, not God in the universe. Because God is bigger than the universe. And you can rewind the tape backward, rewind the tape upward, left or right or top and bottom. Christ is bigger than all this. And he does sustain a relationship with you. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be able to create in you any sense of awe. But you will never, we will never, with the capacity that we have, to give the proper place to Christ and understanding how big he is. So Paul here in verse 19 and 20, he goes to the widest possible word that he can use in Greek to express the divine fullness of Jesus Christ. He doesn't have any words, word than this when you read, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things, I'm coming there in a moment, to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. If you combine these two verses together, he doesn't want to carry on with this. Is out of words right now. All things on earth and in heaven. And I will show you this for a moment. Make the exercise right now, please. Just close your eyes. And think about it. Think about what? God is not in the universe. The universe is in him. That is the extent of his fullness. You can open your eyes if you have closed them. Now we take the word fullness. We did fullness. Okay? When he became incarnate, John chapter 1, verse 14, in that person dwells the fullness of God. And it was eternally in his Son also. All right. Verse 20. I read it uh, already a few times. Is very dependent on verse 19. Why? If you ask me why. Because there is no reconciliation made to God. If the second person is not God and his fullness. You cannot have the reconciliation basically. Okay, so we have looked right now at the word fullness and dwelling, because that fullness was dwelling in Christ. Christ cannot be diminished an ounce apart from the fullness of God. Christ cannot be diminished a mite. From God, because in him dwells the fullness of God. This is crucial for our faith. This is crucial also for our salvation. Come with me in verse 20. We dealt with fullness. 
we dealt with dwelling. Now we come, we dealt with this also. Now we come to the issue of reconciliation. I read again, circle with me. And through him to reconcile. Here it's written reconciliation, but it's okay, it's the noun. All things to himself having made peace through the blood of his cross. Number two, circle that as well. Through him, I say whether things on earth, circle earth, and circle things in heaven. Now you want to make a note here. When somebody, something stands in need to be reconciled, it's because it is at enmity. There could be no reconciliation of things without things being at enmity. I'm going to show it to you in a moment of time. Reconciliation in scriptures basically means this. What you need to delete of your mind right now, it's a couple that separates. And all of a sudden, you, 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 you learn that they have been reconciled together. Okay? It's not the biblical meaning of it. Because God is never standing in need to be reconciled because he doesn't make mistake. He is pure holiness. Okay? So reconciliation in the Bible, apart from the definition that you has there here, it's offending mankind being reconciled to an offended God. Make a note. Apart from this one. Reconciliation is this. It's offending mankind, us, having offended God. So we need to be reconciled to an offended God. God does not need to be reconciled because he doesn't sin. Now, what I like the most, hoping to have your concentration right now, because today I go out of the text of Colossians. Reconciliation, I'm reading the slide right now. Reconciliation in scriptures also means to cause, to conform, to confirm to a standard. To cause, to confirm, confirm to a standard or to be adjusted to a specific standard. That's reconciliation. When he found me, I was basically conform, conform or confirmed to a standard. I think the word conform would be, there, would be better than confirm. Anyway, I think both works. To a standard, to be adjusted to a specific standard. When I was saved, I was brought back to the standard of God. So that he could look upon me because I have Christ. Because when I was born, I was off whack, standard wise, to the standard of God. And he reconciled me to himself by bringing me back to what I'm supposed to be prior to the fall of man. Enmity is a very hard word to say, a word to say for a French person is hostility animosity and separation that's enmity it's to be hostile to to be at animosity with and separated from This is the first word that we have dealt with in verse 20, where it says, and through him Christ to reconcile all things. We have dealt now with reconcile. Do you have any question on this word? Really? You understand that's to cause to confirm or to conform to a standard. I prefer the word conform to a standard, to be adjusted to a specific standard.
You have been reconciled. It's a past tense. It's a past action because you have been brought back at salvation to the standard of God so that he can look upon you. Because when he looks upon you, he does not see you. He sees Christ. And Christ is the absolute standard. So God the Father can look upon you all the time and he sees you according to his standard which we could not meet christ did you have placed your faith in him so therefore god says ernie you meet my standard okay thank you thank you he can look upon you and will he, he will never Turn his face against you. Reconciliation is a done deal. It's not Velcroing. It's not done with Velcro. It's eternal security that you do possess. Despite the mistake that we still do. Are you ready to move on with me? All things. Are you sure? I'm, you're not out of the bush. You, you will need coffee at the end, I promise. Okay. All things, because it says in verse 20, you come with me, we go ver not verse by verse here, we go ver word by word. And through him, Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things, circle all things, this is your expression number two. Make a big two, and we look at all things right now. I have no slide for that stuff, so we're done with the slides. Take time with me and come with me in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Put your outlines in Colossians so you won't lose your place. And come, come with me in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I'm explaining things right now concerning the expression, all things. I covet you. I covet your attention very, very much. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. All right? You come with me. François, verse 20 says of Colossians, don't go. And through him to reconcile all things. Now I'm acting as if one of you would ask me. What does he mean there, Francois, by all things? I have the answer to that. That's very easy. He means all things. But now, what I would like to do with you, it's to show you a few facts here. Okay, I'm sending you in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Remain with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless, or became formless, according to the Hebrew, and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. You don't need to agree with me, but God does not create anything void and formless. Okay? Okay? When he created you, you were not void and formless. Okay? God does not create anything void and formless. It became that way. I'm telling you why right now. It became that way because of the fall of Satan in Ezekiel verse 28. But circle the word ve uh, waste, void or formless. Because when something is waste, void, and formless concerning God's creation, it means that it became at enmity. The planet became in need to be reconciled, reshaped. Because darkness is always a symbol of judgment, and there was a judgment that took place between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. So this planet became in need to be reconciled, to be reconfirmed, 
or conformed to a standard according to the eyes of God. It became darkness. And the Holy Spirit was hovering like a bird over the surface of the planet in order to protect it so that the planet would become reshaped. All right? Come with me in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Come there. You're already there. He reshaped the planet to become an habitat for mankind. He separated the darkness from the daylight and so on. And now we have the creation of mankind in chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Come closely. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. Circle the word rule over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and uh, over creeping things that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, mankind, male and female. He created them. God blessed them. He blessed Adam and Eve. And God said to them, the them is Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Circle, subdue it. Circle, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The subduing of the planet and the ruling over it is before the fall right now. Okay? Then comes the fall. Come with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. On your mind, you should, you should have reconcile and the word enmity. Come with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. It's after the fall. They tasted the fruit. Eve took the lead, gave the fruit to Adam. He ate and now we come to 3.8. They heard the sound of Jehovah God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's the Shekinah glory. And the man and his wife hid. That's all I want. You circle hid. And when you hid yourself, that kick in. Enmity. Shame. They hid. So now Adam and Eve became at enmity with God. A, a child would understand this. When you become at enmity with God, you are now, or mankind now, is in need to be, say the word? Reconcile. Yes. Thank you so much. Reconcile. Look at 3.14. The God said to the serpent, now he talks to the serpent, which is indwelled by Satan, so you can say he talks to Satan. Because you've done this, cursed are you more than the cattle. To curse means enmity. Okay? Go to 15. I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and between the seed of Satan here. Scroll down to 17. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the, from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat. Verse 17, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Curse is the ground. I have a question for you. Don't answer quick, not to make major boo-boo. Is still the surface of the ground of this planet cursed? When was the last time that you went in the bush and picked up blackberry? What was on your arms after you finished picking them up? Thorns. So the surface of the planet here is still under that curse. We get Genesis. Go to 1 John. 
the epistles of John. Go there, please. Go there. 1 John. Find it. It's at the end of your Bible. Very much towards the end, past Colossians. You're going to have 1 Peter and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. You go to 1st John, chapter 5. Find the place, please. Forget about your Colossians if you have lost the place. You will find it again. 1st John, what? Chapter 5, verse 19. François, stop. I'm lost. Okay, good. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says in verse 20 that all things is reconciled to him. Now I'm just going chronologically a little bit and to show you what needs to be reconciled still. And when you have the word reconcile here, it means if I have a need of it, something is at enmity. And I'm talking about where Lots of Christians place their faith in this world. We like it. Christians like this word, world. And it's not supposed to be that way. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says this. We know that we are of God. Stop. Do you know that you are of God? Please say yes, because you are of God. Thank you so much. We know that we are of God. And that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He does not use the past and construction here, does he? As we speak, the world system out there lies in the lap of the evil one. That's why the world, the planet, is at enmity with God. It needs to be reconciled. I will come back later. Now it shows you the extent of all things. Now it shows us the extent of all things of Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. It has not happened yet. That reconciliation is still future. I mean the reconciliation of the surface of the cross to the standards of God. It hasn't happened yet. Now we take the third statement. Peace to the blood of his cross. Now we're back in Colossians. You don't need to go. You know the verse 20. It says, peace to the blood of his cross. In verse 20b, that's what it says here. That's the second statement that I want to take, going in detail such as this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, verse 20 says this. All, things, all, all through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him. He became a man, he's shedding the blood. Okay? To the peace of his cross here, Individually, it's a done deal for you and I. Although some people are still in need out there to be reconciled to God. That's why you share the gospel with them. Do you agree to this? Okay? You share the gospel to them because right now the people outside that are not saved, they are right here at enmity to, with God and they need to be reconciled to God. For myself, from 0 to 33... I was at enmity, but I was, a, I was having an a, a, a angel offering over me to keep me until the day of salvation. Nothing could happen to me, okay? And from 33 to 63, next month, December, 33 to 63, here I have been reconciled, reckoned. From enmity to friendship. From enmity to meeting his standard. And the ultimate standard is the Messiah. The Messiah lives in me. I live in him. So God is happy with me. Francois, we're back to friendship together. You're mine. 
who are no longer together despite your dropping of balls, mistake that you do, we are no longer here at enmity. We are in friendship together, sustaining a relationship, being conformed to his standard. All meaning the same thing. All right? That's individually in the course of time. Number four, coffee. Make a coffee quick, use the washroom, and come back right away. It's not a break. I had a thought, but I lost it. I'm not, I have no doubt about it. <laughs> I have no doubt about it. Until he will reconcile something else in the future. Yeah. Okay? Good. Good stuff. We're bouncing back between pre past, present, and future right now. Mm 